broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on fluctuating currency rates and making the most of a weakened pound. My name is William Barnes Graham, and I'm the Digital Content Manager at Opens Export. We are an online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, Ask the Experts Forum, and our Export Action Plan tool. You can find all of these on our website at www.opentoexport.com. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Exports and International Trade, the UK's only professional membership body for international trade, offering a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious program of events celebrating UK businesses exporting achievements. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session, so please do ask your questions at any point during the webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right hand side of your screen. We have two wonderful speakers today with Kevin Shakespeare from the Institute of Export and International Trade introducing the topic and setting some context for exporters before Rob Affleck from Currency UK will go into more detail about what exporters can do to mitigate against fluctuating, risk, fluctuating rates and some tips around the Brexit impact on pound sterling. But first off, over to you, Kevin. Thank you, uh, Will. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present to you today. So um, I, I will, as uh, Will has indicated, just set the scene uh, in terms of currency risk. And, and let's start by looking at the slide on screen in the context of key principles. So uh, certainly when, when exporters invoice overseas, uh, invoice in, in, in the local currency or the preferred currency of the buyer overseas will naturally improve the chances of winning the export contract. Uh, it makes it easier for the for the buyer to make payment in their own currency, but it also allows them to actually compare the price as well. So that's the good news from an exporter's perspective. However, it does create what is termed an exchange risk. The exporter is opening themselves up to fluctuating exchange rates. So it's important for an exporter or any business trading internationally to, to really understand when foreign exchange currency risk arises. So effectively, as soon as the exporter sells in a currency, which is not their home currency, so in the case of a, a exporter or an exporter in the United Kingdom, a currency which is not pound sterling, they are subject to the risk of fluctuating exchange rates. Uh, and, uh, and, and those exchange rates have the potential to change. Uh, and uh, uh, Rob from Currency UK will, will talk about uh, recent movements and fluctuations in exchange rates. So ultimately, an exporter must do all they can to proactively manage exchange rate risk. So they need to understand how the risk arises, and then they need to try to prevent any negative impacts from those exchange rate movements. So we move on to the next slide. We'll look at the, uh, the main currencies of world trade. Uh, so um, we have at the top here the main what's referred to as the traded currency. So the more active currencies of world trade and um, uh, the US dollar and euro, but also other currencies such as Japanese yen, Great British pound, Australian New Zealand dollar. Uh, on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see the less traded currencies. And, and clearly there's some big economies there in terms of those currencies like the Chinese yuan, the Indian rupee, the Russian ruble. But these are less traded currencies. So from the point of view of an exporter, you would ideally want to, to trade and, and export and sell in the higher traded currencies of the world, which are potentially open to, while still being open to currency fluctuations, potentially as they're traded more, it's easier to, to get an exchange rate uh, and to cover risk in the, in the traded currencies. So we move on to the next slide. We, um, we look at the major currencies in terms of the percentage. And these pretend, uh, percentages were provided by value of trade in 2016. Uh, and this is both sides of a transaction from, uh, from the point of view of both the buyer and the seller in international trade. And as we can see there, the US dollar is the most frequently transacted uh, currency of world trade, followed by the euro, then the Japanese yen, and then pound sterling. 
Um, but we we should also know in the context of the US dollar that uh, uh, the primary reasons that the US dollar is, is the most traded currency is clearly it's the currency of the United States uh, in terms of the size uh, of the US economy, but it's also the currency that's used for most commodity transactions, so likes of oil, gas, steel as well. So some of the large transactions transacted in international trade uh, in, in terms of commodities I mentioned would be traded in US dollars as well. So consequently, lots of countries will effectively hold their currency reserves in US dollars, the likes of Middle Eastern uh, uh, countries, Asian countries as well, because ultimately they will either have to pay or receive revenues from commodities such as oil. So we move on to the next slide. Um, this is an important slide in, in terms of when currency risk can arise. So as we've indicated for an exporter, when they sell uh, to an overseas buyer an invoice in a foreign currency. So that could be in the buyer's currency. So for example, if you're selling to a buyer in Germany, it could be in euros. If you're selling to a buyer in Canada, it could be Canadian dollars, or it could be a third currency as we've indicated, such as US dollars. So if you're selling to the Middle East or the Far East, then settlement could be in US dollars potentially. If you're an importer or you're purchasing goods and services from overseas, you also may pay in that foreign currency. But also if you're uh, uh, an exporter and you've got commission payments uh, to make, for example, to an overseas agent, you may have um, <clears throat> currency to pay that agent in or a third party that's providing consultancy services. Now, as these are commission fees, they may be lower than obviously a full uh, export contract. However, there still will be possibly some element of currency risk involved as well. Um, if we look towards the bottom of this slide, we have an example of an export sale. So in this case, uh, a transaction, an export sale of 10,000 euros. So if myself as an exporter wins this contract today, uh, and receives a, a, an invoice, commercial invoice, for example, or issues commercial invoice to the overseas buyer for 10,000 euros, they may calculate the sterling equivalent. So for example, at a rate of, of, um, of uh, 1.12, and the sterling equivalent in this instance uh, equating to 8,928 pounds. Now that exchange rate in theory would only apply if the exporter got paid today. If, however, the exporter gets paid in 60 days time and those and, and that 60 days might be the terms of trade, the credit terms provided under the sales contract. If the rate has moved, for example, to 1.24, um, then they will receive less. In this instance, example, £8,064. So that is £864 less, which is quite a considerable sum. Now, some people might say, well, actually, the exchange rate could move the other way. It could go to 1.02, for example. Yes, it could, but basically exporters should try and manage their business on the basis of what they do, the products and services they provide. They should try and take the exchange risk out of the transaction uh, so that it, uh, they can actually contract, uh, sorry, concentrate on running the business. So if, if we move to the next slide, this looks at uh, a brief overview of country profile by currency and, and this is won't always be the case because the currency of trade might depend on who your counterparty is, whether it's a large organization or a small organization that you're selling to. But these are, are, are some indications of the currencies of trade that could apply uh, there. China is still predominantly uh, US dollars. It's possible that if you're importing from China, if you pay the actual Chinese supplier in Chinese one, uh, that that can arise. But predominantly, it's still US dollars and, and on occasions, possibly pound sterling. And certainly in the case of India, it could be pound sterling as well. Euro member countries uh, tend to be Euro. And, and, and this is an important point as well, is if you're looking to export to Europe, and you are selling to a euro member uh, country, then there's a big issue around price transparency. So if you are up against competitors, uh, for example, in the other euro member states, then uh, it could be the case that uh, they are invoicing in euros. So if you are not invoicing in euros, it's very difficult for the buyer in that euro state to actually compare prices. 
So uh, in in uh, that could potentially make you uncompetitive, and it could and and the transparency aspect could be an issue there. So um, if we move forward to my final slide now, this looks um, at the ways um, uh, of minimising the impact of exchange rate fluctuations. Now, these are probably two examples, uh, probably the main examples of how companies can manage uh, exchange rate risk from an export perspective. Uh, there are potentially um, other ones which might be available in cir certain circumstances, but I'm going to concentrate on these two main aspects here. Now the first one is the potential for matching currency payables against currency receivables, but that has to be possible. So it's unlikely, unless you're potentially of, of a, a larger company uh, and you have lots of overseas offices, for example, that you will have a perfect match of currency payables and currency receivables. You would need a, a match in monetary terms, but also a match in timings as well, which, uh, we, we, which is unusual uh, to say the least there. But there may be some potential to match some payables uh, and receivables, for example, in, in, in US dollars and euros. But at the end of the day, the likelihood is that the business is still going to have residue exposures uh, there. Uh, and if you are solely an exporter, you are clearly not going to have any currency repayables because you're not importing uh, in the currency um, uh, in question. So one of the uh, predominant methods is selling the currency forward if you are an exporter. So this is uh, referred to as a forward foreign exchange contract. So it's effectively where you are agreeing a rate with your, your foreign exchange provider. Uh, and the example in this instance is, is I, am, I have, have a contract for completion in 90 days time for 100,000 euros. I will go to my, uh, my foreign exchange provider uh, and ask them for a rate where I can sell the currency forward. So effectively what happens there is the rate I am provided it, uh, with, I am locking into that exchange rate. So irrespective of what happens between now, day one and day 90, uh, then uh, I'm locking into the rate and I am securing my foreign exchange rate. Uh, we, we, we may obviously refer more to that later, but that is the, if you like, the principle, the basic principle of that. You have what is termed as a fixed forward foreign exchange contract, where you are fixing the date of maturity of the foreign exchange contract. Um, it's probably harder because you're not 100% certain that you're going to actually receive the money in 90 days time. If you are, fantastic, and you can take out a fixed forward foreign exchange contract. But you might in reality receive it in 91 days, 100 days, or 110 days. And in that instance, what you would do is take out an option forward for an exchange contract, which is an option in terms of dates. So effectively, you, you, you have a range uh, of maturity dates within the option period, for example, 90 to 110 days. So that concludes most of what I wanted to go through to set the scene. I'm now going to pass over to Rob at Currency UK. And thank you for listening to me. Thanks very much for the introduction there, Kevin. Uh, I'll, I'll take it from here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rob Affleck, Head of Sales at Currency UK. Uh, for those of you who haven't already guessed, Currency UK specialises in foreign exchange and international payments. And as a commercial currency broker, uh, we help you get the best currency transfer rates when making or receiving overseas. So with the form a bit over, let's get on with this speech. Uh, essentially, the talk this afternoon is quite simple. Um, I was going to go a bit, bit further on what Kevin has already mentioned. Um, how can we really leverage the most of this week in pound? So some of you may be aware that we had a referendum on EU membership, um, the effect of which we can still feel now. So the referendum result itself presented a fairly unique problem in that businesses hadn't prepared risk scenarios for a future outside the EU. Uh, the headlines told us that there was a reasonable chance that nothing would change but that if it did, it would have a massive effect on the currency. So I think by now, we've heard what happened in the immediate aftermath. Um, since last June's Brexit votes, 
export volumes are up 6%. However, over that period, import volumes are also up 6.3%, uh, suggesting no contribution has been made to GDP growth from net goods trade. Uh, that was confirmed again this morning um, with more data um, regarding our import and export uh, trade deficit. So looking at that data, it's particularly concerning when you consider a backdrop of a 13% fall in sterling uh, post-referendum, not to mention um, the significant improvement in global growth prospects. So it really does look like we're, we're struggling there. Now add to that the fact that Europe's a key trading partner for the UK and the situation is starting to look really pretty dire. Um, the explanation for this in short um, is that the, the impact of a weakened pound has been less pr pronounced than it might have been in the last 10 or 20 years. And that's largely down to the increasingly interconnected nature of global supply chains. And that means that currency fluctuations are, are less of a key factor in competitiveness of business. And looking back, um, why did the Brexit vote itself cause the decline in the value of sterling, you might ask? One plausible explanation is that the currency market as a whole feared that the UK would have an inferior trading relationship um, with the EU after its, after its withdrawal. And that even if it does establish a free trade agreement with the EU, that that would be worse than its current arrangement. This leads on to the complex international supply chains underlying the production of many goods being disrupted. Um, and therefore the, the EU would, be, or the UK rather, would become a less attractive venue for foreign direct investment. So just as a, as a disclaimer here, I, I have to say before anyone gets so upset, it, myself, currency UK, the currency markets in general, all of these speculators making money, they don't have any overt political leanings. They're literally working on opportunity and profit. Uh, so therefore, they would see this beautiful island that we call home as UK PLC. So their devaluation of sterling is literally dependent entirely on their, their view of how much profit they'll be getting out of it at the end of it. Obviously, we see things differently if we sat here um, on this beautiful isle in the middle of the North Sea. Um, but naturally, we would see things differently than a New York trader who, who may be quite up to date with the Brexit thing in his office. Um, but certainly wouldn't have the passion to defend why why we'd vote for that sort of thing. Um, for him, it's it, in his eyes, the simplistic way of looking at it is that it will disrupt trade purely through uncertainty. Um, so with that said, it must be pointed out that all this sterling fall basically means that uh, that the UK can become a more attractive place for exporters in general. If nothing else, we can compete with the global markets uh, because we're now cheaper. So delving into specific sectors, just as an example, uh, the vehicle export industry is particularly exposed given that the UK exports 40% of our cars to Europe. In terms of pricing and a weaker pound versus the Euro, it makes exporting cars to Europe cheaper although the unpredictability of post-Brexit tariffs to European counterparts could potentially mean cars face an additional tariff when exporting and therefore making it less favourable to trade uh, with the UK. So the position of sterling becomes even weaker when there's a rhetoric suggesting a hard Brexit will be the outcome. Conversely, sterling regains some strength and there is rhetoric suggesting that we'll get a soft Brexit deal. And the evidence behind that is, is seen when the High Court ruled that the Brexit deal would have to be passed by Parliament. Um, and the markets would perceive that as an increased likelihood of get, us getting a better deal. Again, matter of conjecture, you may have differing opinions. Um, but as a result of that decision, uh, Sterling did gain some strength and partially softened the initial fall um, suffered immediately after the referendum. And in terms of the hard Brexit, um, the effect on sterling is, is caused by uncertainty. 
we just don't know what's going to happen next. And the markets, they just don't like uh, uncertainty. So having said that, it isn't quite as clear cut as I may have just made it. Um, in terms of Brexit is bad, hard Brexit is worse, soft Brexit is better. Um, the value of sterling did fall 12% after the Brexit vote, and there were headlines of sterling hitting 30-year lows against the US dollar. But it's important to keep in mind for this statistic that it's not just UK-centric. This is a mixture of the pound losing strength uh, and the US dollar gaining strength. The US dollar, or the US, uh, for example, came out of the 2008 recession sooner than the UK did. And as a result, their economy was further along the path of recovery than that of the UK's. Also, it wasn't just Brexit. Uh, swiftly following the result itself, the Prime Minister tendered his resignation, leaving us rudderless uh, as we float towards an uncertain future. And the markets, as I've already told you, hate uncertainty. Um, political uncertainty is probably one of the biggest by comparison, for example, Mr. Trump, whatever our personal opinion of his political effectiveness, um, is in power. There is someone standing at the helm, and therefore, in the market's eyes, that's better than no one. Way back in November 2015, for example, sterling was comfortably trading against 140 against the euro. And as the markets awaited the expansion of the ECB's asset purchase scheme, and therefore anticipated a, a further devaluation in euro value. Mr. Draghi didn't announce the expected expansion, the markets had got it wrong, um, and consequently concluded that eurozone woes were smaller than they'd, they'd already priced in. And that euro rate dropped, or in market terms, corrected to under 130 by the time David Cameron announced the referendum in the first place. Um, and that is almost as big a move as the the effect of the referendum result being revealed. So for the uh, economic historians amongst you, you will notice that that asset purchase scheme continues at a rate of 60 billion euros a month to this day. So I think we can safely assume that the, the Eurozone woes were far from being fixed at the time, but the market simply looks to the next uncertainty to fear. So overall, this isn't the most surprising economic outcome. It looks like British manufacturing output is up, and that it's an increase in exports driving said rise, which is exactly what we would all expect to happen after such a change in relative prices for these price, supply, and demand things. It seems the heart of micro microeconomics do in fact work. There are reasonable, if not in, always entirely accurate, description of the manner in which the universe works. In contrast to our classic economic rules, we would generally expect trade deficits to rise after a currency falls. But that's a short-term effect. That's something we, we would refer to as a J-curve. Um, and, and really, that's referring to the trend of a country's trade balance following a devaluation or depreciation under a certain set of assumptions. And in our case, that's Brexit and the weakened pound. So it's no surprise to see Britain's manufacturing industry getting a, a boost from the weaker pound, which is strengthening export demands and offsetting concerns about uh, the prospect of Brexit. As things become cheaper, people desire to purchase more of them. A fall in the pound makes external investors and clients keener to buy British goods. Equally, the same curve tells us that people buy less of more expensive things. Thus, a fall in the pound means Brits buy less made by global clients. Thus, exports should rise, imports fall when the pound falls. Meanwhile, higher import prices should, in theory, encourage UK households to move towards domestically produced goods and services and away from imported goods, right? Well, true, but bear in mind that this all takes time. So I have a real-life scenario to present here. Um, one of my clients, a businessman, and in this instance, I'll have to call him Bob, seeing as I, I can't reveal uh, my client's identities. Bob had left his previous company where he was working as a sales director 
and he left and set up his own company in the same sector. He was buying goods from China uh, and selling them in the UK and Europe. So as a one-man startup, Bob had all the contacts and expertise on the sales side of the business to be a roaring success. And being a sales director, Bob was well-versed in costing and spreadsheets, had a basic knowledge of accounting. Uh, the problem, though, was when costing goods from China was the lead time could be as much as six months. So what is for sale in China and made by us could have been ordered six months ago or so. Uh, so today's imports and exports uh, are much more reflective of demand at the exchange rate of some time ago. So in other words, he's likely to have to pay for stuff at today's exchange rate while having ordered it under the past one. The things ordered back then now cost him more as the pound slides, meaning that the slide can actually increase the trade deficit when measured in pound sterling. Uh, this is the difference between the changes in volumes of trade and the prices of said trade. So as a startup, the company couldn't afford to front all the US dollar costs up front, only to be paid in sterling or euros four to five months later. A lack of trading history meant loan-based products were very expensive, um, and, and Bob spent a lot of time sweating over spreadsheets showing currency exposure. So the, the dollars that had to be bought, what they were costed at, the current price, but without the available cash to buy them with. So in all, that spreadsheet just brought stress and a constant reminder of his cash flow limitations. When the price was good, and believe me, Bob was watching it, there wasn't enough cash flow to act. And when the price was bad, profit margins were circling the plug hole and there really wasn't anything to be done. So in effect, this caused the growth of his company to be stunted. Opportunities were missed, basically, because he couldn't take on any more risk. So after a, a consultation, uh, the solution we came to was really quite simple. We were talking about hedging or taking out forward contracts on individual supply orders. And that meant one price for each order, one exchange rate to write on the invoices, which could then be filed until goods arrive. The contracts were structured, as Kevin covered earlier, um, with a window. And that, that allowed for delayed start dates and the client paid a small deposit to secure the exchange rate. So Bob was then able to arrange sales, place orders with suppliers, eliminate all exchange risk on his orders uh, with suppliers, and then move straight onto the next sale. Most importantly, Bob's profit was locked in on the same day his goods were ordered. The goods were already sold. Currency fluctuations were then irrelevant. No more spreadsheets, no more stress. So for the next two years of working together, Bob's orders from the Chinese suppliers grew 400% year on year. And he saved money, obviously, on what his bank were charging him. Um, and I might add that when I spoke to him shortly before the uh, Brexit vote itself, and I said to him, how was he feeling about things? What, what was his plan? And he said, well, everything that I have outstanding is done. Therefore, I'm going to fold my arms and see what happens. And whatever happens at the end of it, I'll then go back out to the market where everyone's sitting in the same place. No risk. So what does this mean uh, for finance, for SMEs post-Brexit? For exporters, foreign currency revenues are worth more, and you're cheaper to overseas customers. We, and brokers like us, can help by locking in future currency rates, and therefore your profit margins. For many exporters with regular overseas income, this is a great time to lock in a percentage of future sales too, meaning profit forecasts are more accurate. And of course, there's less risk. For importers, there is no escaping the fact that we're sat on a small island in the North Sea. Hedging can smooth out the bumps in the exchange rates, as my client Bob has done. Using market orders can help the cash rich to snap up preferential or budgeted rates. And that will happen immediately should the opportunity arise. So, for example, if you had a budgeted rate of 125 to buy euros, you may now 
need to look at revising your budget rate, it seems unlikely that you'll be getting that this year. So therefore, just update it to reflect current market conditions or face reporting a foreign exchange loss at the end of the year. However, if you've budgeted 115 and you put in a limit order at that level, as soon as it triggers, and at, at the time of speaking, we're, we're floating around 111, 112, um, as soon as it triggers, your broker will have secured the currency amount that you requested at that rate. The only downside, of course, is that you have to cough up within two working days. So stick to affordable amounts unless you are cash rich. So in terms of really wrapping up, now is a great time for businesses that wish to expand overseas. And I would positively encourage everyone to start thinking about it in the national interest. Not only are we at almost a nine-year low on interest rates, the rise of alternative financiers allows SMEs to access different types of debt funding to grow and fulfill invoices and orders without running into working capital problems. However, I understand how it does look uh, like it's a tough time to trade, what with confidence remaining low, and the FX markets certainly seem extremely volatile. In short, exporters should think about currency exposure risk mitigation just in order to enable they're not exposed to FX uh, fluctuations, swings and the like. And of course, have a competitive rate to purchase their goods or services as well as pay their end debt at all customers. So whatever happens on the volatility front, there is a plan. We just need to mold it to your business. Thank you all for your time. Um, I'll hand you back to, to Will. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Kevin, as well. Um, I mean, lots of lots of insights and kind of tips to kind of dig into there. Um, I'm going to open the floor now to questions, so please do um, ask questions using the control panel on the right hand side of the screen to obviously very good experts here to to pick the brains of. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask, I'm going to put to Rob, um, and it's just it's a question around kind of what are the typical fee structures with foreign exchange brokers and isn't it normal for, for um, a company to, is it normal for a Forex company to ask for a deposit if setting up a forward contract with them? So over to you, Rob. Well, with the, the deposit side of things, um, really we do that for good reason. Uh, that's to avoid people speculating on our behalf with our money uh, and not coughing up at the end of it. So essentially, we're, we're protecting ourselves. It's, you can put, obviously, as we're currency brokers, you can pay the deposit in any, any currency. Um, it does get taken off the bill at the end. It's not an extra fee. Um, but essentially, what we do is uh, put that to one side. In the event that you don't fulfill the contract, if there's any loss, um, because we have to sell back the currency that we don't need or buy back the currency you requested, that covers any loss. If there isn't any loss, then we return the deposit. That's, it's basically a safeguard for us. But if we didn't do that, then we would have lots of people ringing us up and saying, could I buy 20 million US dollars at so-and-so rate? And they would also do it with the broker next door and the broker next door, all at different levels. Um, so yes, it, it, it would quickly get messy if we didn't. But having said that, it's literally for protection only. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question we've had in from Harry. I'm going to put this to Kevin first and, and then see if Rob has anything to add to it. Um, and it's around kind of uh, setting up a bank account overseas. Um, kind of uh, when when's the right time to do that? When when's it when's a good idea? when would you recommend doing that? Um, over to you, Kevin. Yeah, it's 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 a good question. And what I would also say is is some of the regulations on setting uh, a bank account overseas are are more stringent today than they than they they were hitherto maybe 10 20 years ago mainly due to to issues around compliance money laundering and and, and issues like that um, certainly if uh, if your organization has an overseas subsidiary company it will need an overseas bank account so um, that, that, that that's a most obvious reason to do that uh, and if you have a legal entity a subsidiary company overseas then um, it, it clearly will be a lot easier to to get an overseas bank account 
if however you don't have a trading entity overseas uh, and you you try and open what's called a non-resident account that is going to be harder so you might for example say well actually I'd like a non-resident account uh, because um, I'd like all my uh, my customers overseas to pay me locally as opposed to pay cross-border which in theory can uh, sometimes in practice can be higher charges but a lot of banks will have difficulty opening up non-resident accounts there's possibly one or two org financial organizations that, that may have what's called pay through collection accounts but it's also fair to say that the authorities would also look at those as well and 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 look at source of funds where the money's coming from but if you're looking to expand overseas and set up an overseas company then it makes eminent sense to uh, to set up an overseas bank account so that the receivables for your overseas subsidiary uh, can be paid through that bank account thank you Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, a question now for Rob from Oliver. Um, he asks, uh, kind of, what alternative finance platforms in particular could you recommend for, for a startup looking to minimize the effects of volatility and manage, it, and manage cash flow? Um, so, Rob. Sorry, that was a bit unclear. Could you read that again? Yeah, sure. So it, it was around, I think, your point around alternative finance um, platforms and solutions for SMEs kind of starting an export um, that you mentioned at the end. I, I think Oliver is just looking for a bit of um, clarification of what sorts of things you were talking about. Well, I'm, I'm well aware that this is a burgeoning uh, an industry. I couldn't recommend any per se. Um, not directly anyway. What I can say is that what you want to do is make sure that they are um, authorized with the FCA, there are thousands of them. Basically, as with all things, you really need to look at does it seem too good to be true? Is there any track history, um, longevity? Are they regulated by the FCA? And after that, it's really a case of, of speaking to a few of them and finding out what they're going to do for you. It's really now more about the service side of things as opposed to the standard ask the bank, see if they say yes or no to loan you what you've asked for, um, and then find out what their terms are. Um, it's very much the other way around now, in that basically uh, everybody wants a cut of the pie, and therefore you do have the new disruptive models where basically they're going for customer service first and trusting the business to take care of itself afterwards. Thank, thank you, Rob. And, and Kevin, do you have anything to add there? Have you come across any in, in particular which you might recommend or would you just kind of um, follow Rob's advice there? Yeah, I, I guess obviously it it's, uh, depends on the business and, and the business circumstances. So if a business is looking to borrow money of any sort, um, having a, a good business plan is very important. Uh, so you, you, you need to make sure you have an export plan which covers elements such as the marketing, the sales, how are you going to achieve them, some of the financial models. So you stand more chance of gaining investment where, wherever that is from if you can uh, e effectively develop a, a business plan. And, and also I think as, as Rob's alluded to is if you're going to deal with someone you need to make sure they're regulated uh, so any any good provider will will indicate on their website that they're registered with, a, with the, the FCA the Financial Conduct Authority so um, it's 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 about sort of being careful but look at it in the context of your business what's best for your business and um, in terms of, uh, of, of a source of finance Many thanks, Kevin and, and Rob there. Um, a question from Wendy, and Wendy asks, on average, what is the minimum amount required before SMEs can use forward uh, foreign contracts or other currency options to secure an exchange rate? Um, so, uh, Rob, can I put that to you first, please? Hello, Rob? Well, uh we would work it out on a case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, sometimes there is a, a clear need for a small one. Um, my client, Bob, for example, he, he does do anything from the smallest would probably be in sterling value about 4,000 quid's worth. Um, but it's basically the volume. It's, it's the strategy that we follow 
and the fact that each and every order is is completely covered and risk free. Um, technically, there's no lower limit, but having said that, if it is going to be low, very low amounts, then might be a more practical solution. If you have the cash, why not just just buy it there and then? Um, that's all I can say, really. I mean, you know, the, it's a case by case basis. You do get some big ones, some small ones. Um, I would say, really, call us and we'll find out. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, that sounds like a pretty good, good advice. I guess it's, it's, there's a, a range of um, different, different forexes will do different things, but um, yeah, case by case sounds like a sensible approach anyway. Um, we've had a question in from Sonia and from Ikram, and it's around kind of um, durations of fixed forward contracts. Um, what, what, what generally is the duration of these contracts, uh, Rob? Well, again, we're, what we're aiming for is a bespoke. We're, we're trying to solve the pain that you, you're feeling. So, in other words, you know, if you do have 30-day term, um, then it will be 30 days plus or minus a little bit so that you can you, you have a window just in case they don't pay on time, weekends, bank holidays, that sort of stuff, the unpredictable. Having said that, I mean, you can do a maximum of two years. It's not terribly practical in, in all people. I mean, basically, the, you know, the, the really big companies will be hedging for a long, long time, as far out as they can, because they just want continuity. Um, and they're, they're pretty assured um, of future incomes, future sales, and things like that. Smaller companies, yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it's particularly worthwhile unless it's a really big one-off project or, or similar, really business critical to go beyond your normal accounting cycle, which in most people's book would be a year. Because um, after that, it, it could get a bit, bit more costly than it's worth. Having said that, two years is the absolute maximum. But again, we, we would be matching out to the business requirements, basically, and recommending on that basis. Thanks, thanks, Rob. Um, and a question in from Ian. I just mean it might get a similar answer, but I'll, I'll put it through anyway. I um, mean, do can a company get a better exchange rate if they're for the more currency they're buying? Do do kind of forex companies do deals like that, Rob? Yeah, they do. Um, the generally the cutoffs would be slightly larger than than you'd imagine. I mean, it's yes, there are. It, we're essentially a wholesaler. The more you buy, the cheap the cheaper it gets for us to handle. Um, but again, it re it really depends how much you were thinking. And you know, if you were thinking, oh well, if I buy, you know, ten thousand quid instead of five thousand quid, do I get a much better deal? It it will look modest. When you compare those sorts of values, will there be a difference between buying five thousand and ten thousand, or you know, selling thereof? There will be a noticeable difference, and there will be a much more noticeable difference once it's you know a million or so. It really, really does depend on the sort of work involved, basically. Um, some of the clients will be uh, using our bank accounts to receive, you know, a fair few uh, medium-sized payments and. And therefore, we don't just look at the, the foreign exchange itself. We would be looking at, you know, the use of our bank accounts and receiving money on their behalf and things like that. There are other people who will ring us up and just say, right, that's it. We have a million dollars to sell this afternoon. We want it in and out this afternoon. What can you do me? And they're, they're not expecting to pay very much for that based on the fact that we're really not having to do much work uh, apart from click a few buttons. So you you will notice it, but uh, the cutoffs are slightly bigger than most people expect. So I, I would say, you know, first cutoff being probably about five thousand. After that, twenty five thousand, then a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, and then a hundred thousand. Obviously, this is a fairly flexible sliding scale, but at the same point, you know, that's really where you're going to notice the the real difference between rates offered. Thanks, thanks, Rob. And one last question I'm going to put forward to Kevin. Um, Kevin, in your presentation, you mentioned about options, um, and Stacey's asked kind of if you could go into a bit more detail about how these work. So uh, over to you, Kev. 
Yeah. So we, we, one of the one of the um, one of the terms of options I referred to was the option forward for an exchange contract, which is an option uh, uh, a sort of uh, in terms of dates and also referred to as a sort of window of dates as well. Um, the the sort of concept around uh, an option and I don't necessarily want to use terms like derivatives, caps and collars. Uh, is 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 potentially or in theory where 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 someone has uh, an option to actually take up the contract to maturity. Now those are heavily regulated, uh, and and certainly for SME businesses uh, shouldn't necessarily be considered. At the end of the day, and and uh, 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 Rob's very much alluded to this, it's about what's best for your business and what your circumstances. I guess looking at a currency option per se is if you were if you were tendering for an overseas contract, um, let's say for example you were an engineering company, construction company, uh, and you had a three month tender period, you may be in a situation where you are pricing your tender uh, on a certain exchange rate, and um, if if that tender is not awarded for say 90 days you are in a situation where if you don't hedge in some way that the exchange rate could have in theory moved against you so suddenly your your initial pricing no longer applies and you're having to fulfill the contract at a different uh, uh, sterling receivable so in those circumstances you could look at potentially a currency option which is really in that instance if you're an exporter an option to sell um, however, you would need to speak to your foreign exchange provider as to a whether they are happy and able to provide that. There will also be monetary floor limits to that type of transaction. So, in 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 essence, if you have a valid trade transaction and you are a valid business and can provide evidence of a tender process, uh, then uh, uh, potentially an options can sell to apply. But if you're trying to use an option to sell for speculation, uh, I uh, I would suspect that uh, that is not a wise thing to do because uh, that is effectively just speculating. Uh, Rob, do you, would you add anything to that? Or is, uh, is that fairly reasonable? Yeah. Uh, personally, uh, my advice to everyone that isn't uh, Regulated by the FCA themselves, I would say stay well away from the derivative option. But it's also a, another term for what I would refer to as a, a window on your on your forward contract. And again, I mean, you know, we we deal with these all the time. And if you have, for example, a new supplier um, or new sales contract, for example, you send them an invoice and you tell them 30 days you pay me, sunshine. But if it's the first time that they pay you, you can't be sure. But you know they can get the uh, payment set up on their bank, and you know go through the fraud checks to make them show the invoice to show why they're paying, who they're paying, and all the rest of it. There may be unexpected delays. So if you stick a window um, on that forward contract and say, right, two weeks, any point within these two weeks, when the money rocks up, that is my currency is pre-sold at that rate. It it just makes life very easy. And in comparison, just the just to flesh out, you know, the difference there, a standard forward contract would be a set date. So if you say 30 days on that 30th day, that's when the money is due in. If it's not, you've broken the contract. And technically, the money the money isn't available at that rate. Um, but having said that, you know, this isn't a game of catching people out because that isn't very good for business. So technically, most of our our forwards now are worked with at least some form of uh, window on them because we, we want to be flexible. Great. Well, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rob. And thanks, Kevin, uh, again, for all of those answers and for both presentations. I think it's probably time for us to wrap up now. Um, but yeah, thank you both again. I, I hope everyone's found that useful. Um, some real uh, kind of genuine expertise on currency. Right, so, um, so you're warmly invited to the Institute of Exports and International Trade annual members dinner in November. Open to all, it's a great chance to find out more about the Institute, celebrate the UK's achievements in international trade, and also hear Michael Portillo give what I'm sure will be an intriguing speech. And if you're looking to further your career or gain the skills needed to advance your company's exporting prospects, the Institute offers a wide range of qualifications which really do help individuals and businesses to thrive in international trade. 
In terms of upcoming webinars, we'll hopefully be announcing an IncoTerms webinar for early November over the next few days. But in the meantime, we do have a couple of sessions around exporting to China, booked in with the China-Britain Business Council as part of a feature month we're running for the creative and tech sectors in particular. So please do have a look at opentexport.com forward slash webinars for more info on all of those. As always, please take our exit survey to let us know what you thought of the webinar and to give us any suggestions for improvements or future topics. That's all from us for now. Have a great rest of the week and goodbye.